Welcome to Pyramind's Mixing and Mastering with Ableton Live. Really glad to have you here. This is a very fun part of our journey where we get to get into the nuts and bolts of setting up a mix, what it means to deliver a quality mix, and all the components that are involved along the way uh, right into your mastering journey. Uh, mastering means preparing that mix that you've created. In this case, it's a stereo mix that we're going to be exporting from our multi-track configuration that's being built in Ableton Live and exporting that mix to stereo for final mastering uh, and export for streaming service delivery. Now, I emphasize streaming service delivery because there are uh, other ways you can export tracks for download, for CD mastering. For the purpose of this class, we're going to be referencing um, streaming services, and that's a standard that uh, is across the board for the majority of releases today. We will reference other um, metering and loudness units required for other purposes of delivery, uh, but most of the time uh, I'm going to be talking about streaming services and referencing those levels. So uh, we're going to do this all in Ableton. You're going to have, we're going to use various different sessions throughout uh, this process, uh, several of which you will have access to. Uh, I'm going to start this process with a multi-track session that was delivered to us by JTEC. Uh, who is also one of our mentors, longtime mentors and instructors. And uh, it's one of his tracks called Amnesia Dreaming. Uh, we're also going to be working with a session from a group called Dogon Lights called High Steppa. Uh, that's a cool track because uh, it kind of sets, uh, sets a, a, a different tone uh, by using live drums, live guitar, bass, uh, so we don't want it to all be electronic. We want to mix this up and give you some varying choices to work with. Uh, so we've got Amnesia Dreaming. We've got High Steppa. Uh, we've also got uh, another track that we'll be working with uh, from Gavin Hardkiss, uh, a remix done with him uh, called Rain Cry. Uh, so a lot of really great source material here for us to work from. I uh, hope you enjoy it. And uh, as always, uh, never hesitate to ask your mentor any questions along the way. Uh, that's what they're there for in the group sessions. And then also to be able to present any of these as mixes for feedback uh, in your final one-on-one -on -one session. You could present either um, any one of the tracks that we're uh, going to let you mix with, or of course, one of your own. Uh, we always know how much more fun it is to be mixing a track of your own, but from an experiential standpoint, it certainly helps to have um, other tracks to work with and experiment with and to follow along with. Um, so uh, this first one, like I said, is called Amnesia Dreaming by JTEC, and uh, we're going to start digging in to exporting and configuring your session for mix using Amnesia Dreaming. See you in that video next. Hey there. So let's start talking right away about setting up for the mix process. What does it mean to set up for a mix? And why shouldn't you mix directly out of the session that you created your project in? So there's some uh, definite pros and cons there, mostly cons, and I'm going to tell you why. Um, when you're creating a session, you're doing a lot of experimenting. Um, and you've got perhaps a lot of sample playback systems in there, um, synths, uh, virtual instruments, let's put it that way, that are uh, taking up a lot of CPU processing power. And ultimately, the best thing to do for a mix is to freeze and flatten those down to audio. And once you've frozen and flattened things down to audio, you begin to free up your CPU processing power because you want to be able to prepare your mix so that you'll have plenty of processing power to use effects processing uh, throughout the course of the mix. And effects, by effects processing, I mean uh, EQs, compressors, reverbs, delays, saturators, and other tonal manipulative processes that will allow you to craft your mix in a way that will ultimately express the track in its best possible light. And if your CPU is choking down with lots of virtual instruments, you're going to hit a brick wall really fast. Uh, so the best way to do this is to freeze and flatten your tracks. In this case, you'll notice here in the session that I've got on the screen, 
all of the tracks have already been exported to audio. So all of these tracks having been exported to audio make it easy for me to now scan through and play everything at Unity Gain. So I can just get a sense of what's going on with the track just the way it is uh, in terms of its sheer creation. The other thing I'm going to do now is have nothing on any of the tracks. So they simply are the way they are, the way you created them in your um, composition session. Uh, and that's the, the session that you actually built and developed the track in. And now all of that has been frozen and flattened and exported to audio. Exporting is a very easy process in Ableton. Uh, you can go to Command Shift R um, and then you can go here and render out the tracks. And in the case of a frozen and flattened session, what I would do there is take all individual tracks, select the range, the appropriate range for them, and then export them. Uh, if, I, if I've created it, the session at 48K, I would keep it at 48K. Um, definitely want 24 bits at the minimum here. 24-bit uh, 48K is considered high definition on certain platforms. Uh, and that's kind of the minimum standard for high definition. Of course, if you are going to CD, you're ultimately going to go down to 44.1. Um, but for the purposes of this demonstration and for this class, I'm going to recommend working at 48K and 24 bits. So once you've exported those, and the, you can, you know, using your, you can use your selector bracket to predetermine the range. So in this case, uh, this would have been selected like so. You would highlight all the tracks and you would say export audio video. And there it would automatically uh, configure to that range. And all individual tracks would then be exported. So let's talk a little bit about mixing in mono and why referencing mono is so important. Uh, one of the first things that I like to do is actually put a utility on the master so you can see that utility right here um, you can search for utility it's easy to find um, it's one of my um, go-to's um, on all my channels almost certainly all my groups in the master uh, throughout the mixing process for various reasons and um, right now what i like to do just in the beginning of a mix process i'll listen to uh, the whole mix in mono so there we are in mono now. I'm just soloing the drums. We can bring everything in. That's in mono. There it is in stereo. I like to kind of bounce between the two a little bit and get a sense of where the, the real energy of the mix is versus where the ear candy is. That's ear candy, right? Uh, but the kick, the bass, the low end, where the drive of this is coming from, that wants to be more focused. And typically that's going to be better served in mono. Uh, it's going to respond better on speakers. There's going to be more focused energy uh, when putting it in mono. So uh, I'll listen to the mix first, and then I'll kind of go through and go, okay, I'm assessing where the low-end energy is. I want to define where that is, and I'm going to, like, for example, solo up my kick here. And I've got a utility on there, too. It's already monoed. But I can't even really hear a difference anyway, because even though it looks like it's in stereo and you can see a track is in stereo in Ableton when you see a left and a right side, that doesn't necessarily mean it's actually stereo. It may just have been printed that way. So it's important to reference it, use your ears, and then decide for yourself whether it's better suited as a mono or a stereo track. Um, in this case, because it's a dry kick, there's not even any reverb because reverb is going to add ambience and by nature reverb creates stereo imaging because it simulates a room or an environment so that creates stereo width but when it's dry like this there's no there's nothing there but the the, the hit and the low end i'm gonna my preference is going to be to have that be mono and chances are along with that kick there's going to be some electronic pumping bass here, and it's going to want to kind of lock right in with that um, and have itself be mono too. Here's the bass. Now, sometimes when my signal is that low, it's really hard to hear or define it. What I like to do is also go in and just adjust the clip bass gain up. Give myself a little more meat to work with here. Uh, and the software likes that. It likes to be driven a little hotter. Uh, and given that I have this much headroom on my um, 
my meters i've got plenty to work with here you can we can look at our insight meter and we can see we're at way down here at neg 23.8 neg 24 with that kick um so i've got a long way a long way to go here uh to get to um the ultimate desired range here of gain. So this is just a good place to start um, as I begin to think about what's gonna be mono, what's gonna be stereo in my mix, and what really is stereo. When you start to look at all of these tracks here, you'll notice that they were all printed in a way that makes them look like they're stereo. Look, every single one has a left and a right, but I'm certain that not all of them are. And some of these things, particularly like in the drum mix here, if we solo up, let's uh, let's solo up the entire drum kit here. So now you can hear some elements moving left to right. Um, and that's probably because I already panned them a little bit. So for example here, the shaker is panned to the right. The hi-hat's panned a little bit to the left. Um, and it starts to give breath to the drums, or width is a good way to look at it. Um, and I'm doing that right on the panner right here. So for example, here's the shaker. Um, let's unsolo all the drums for a moment there it is there's that shaker you can hear it it's on the right side i could move it to the left side and it may very well be that you know that happens in the context of the mix it doesn't have to stay in one place remember one of the exciting parts about building a mix is once you've defined these positions what's mono what's left what's right what's stereo then oh, wow, can I make this really exciting and have things start to move? And that's what we call automation. And we'll be talking about that in upcoming videos. But certainly the first thing to think about is mono. Where's my mono? Where's my energy center? What am I going to put in mono? And then what am I going to build around that? Um, and a lot of what ends up being built around it are the high-end frequency elements like these shakers, like these hi-hats here. Here's another one, the hi-hat up here. Uh, there's another shaker there and another hi-hat down below, especially coming down here at the end, right? Um, and then the rest of those, uh, the more low-end elements, the kick. As I bring all of these in, the clap. You can see it makes it exciting to have the, the high-frequency stuff shaking around in my head a little bit and then keeping the driving energy centerpieces right up the middle. 